Hello, and welcome to our webinar, Assessing GDPR 30 Days In, Reports from the Field and Enforcing Established Policies. My name is Todd Cole, and with us today, we have Jay Kramer, Marty Proven, and John Batsakis. Jay Kramer is a partner in the New York office of Lewis Brisbois and a member of the Data Privacy and Cybersecurity Practice. Jay advises his legal clients based on his comprehensive understanding of the ever-shifting cyber threat landscape, as well as significant experience in formulating an effective response to regulations, including GDPR. Prior to Lewis Brisbois, Jay was an attorney with the FBI, serving in senior leadership positions, including within the Office of General Counsel and the FBI Cyber Division. Jay was a founding member of its Cyber Law Unit, where he helped investigate teams tackle complex issues of law and policy nationwide. Marty Proven is Executive Vice President of Jordan Lawrence, a leading solution provider for data privacy and information governance. He has over 20 years of experience in information technology and governance. Marty joined Jordan Lawrence in 2003 and advises in-house counsel, compliance, and privacy professionals in the areas of record management, data privacy, and e-discovery, and the confluence of technology in these areas. He's a certified information privacy professional and frequent contributor and speaker in the legal and privacy communities. John Pizakis is the founder and executive chairman of X1 Discovery. John has an extensive background and expertise in e-discovery and corporate compliance. Prior to joining X1, John spent nearly a decade at Guidance Software, where he held senior management positions, including vice chairman, chief legal officer, and president and CEO. Prior to joining Guidance, John spent eight years practicing law in the fields of commercial litigation and business transactions. Over to you, John. Thank you, Todd. And I want to welcome and thank all of our attendees attending this live webinar today. Looking forward to a great discussion. I also want to thank my co-presenters, Jay Kramer of Lewis Brisbois and Marty Proven of Jordan Lawrence. Thank you, Jay and Marty, and I am really looking forward to the insight from you both. So today, we are going to first get a battlefield report of sorts from Jay and also from Marty about what they have seen from the field and hearing from their various clients. And then we'll delve into the importance of information governance and supported GDPR compliance really especially from a, the standpoint of the need to operationalize your policies and procedures so that you can identify non-compliant data throughout your network and properly respond to a data subject access request. We will also have an interactive Q&A and we'll be sure to leave uh, ample time to answer your questions at the end. All right, so with that, um, Jay, you have the floor, and from your perspective on advising your clients on GDPR, what are you seeing now that we are a little more than 30 days in? Sure, sure. Thanks, John, and thanks, Todd, for that, that nice introduction. It's a pleasure to join join you folks. So uh, from, from my perspective uh, as a partner in, in a data privacy and cybersecurity practice, our view on GDPR is guided uh, by the incident response work that we're doing every day. And they are related, and, and I'll get to that in just a moment, how any of a host of data security incidents that we're seeing, uh, uh, breaches, data compromises, encryption attacks, and um, how they're related to this regulation and preparedness for the environment that we're living in today. Um, I hope that it, it's my hope in, in the next few minutes we talk about some real practical things and make this webinar and, and the discussion with you, Marty and John, and, and questions, please send in questions if you like. This is professional development, right? So it's our goal that, that, that you get any questions answered that you have about this regulation, which really is very different um, from anything we've seen so far. So uh, to your point, John, your question about 30 days in, where are we? Uh, as you know, the regulation the GDPR was a long time in coming. It, it, drafting on it began in 2006. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, 2011. And its implementation, its approval was in 2016. So we've, we've had a couple of year grace period. But from what I'm seeing, our, our clients that have reached out have really only reached out in the past several weeks. Kind of a last minute thing to say, you know, what is this regulation? What is it about? What do I need to know? And the focus has really been on the immediate. 
and and not necessarily the important. So what are those immediate things that that have been asked, and what are people doing to to come up to speed with the regulation? Well, some of those things, uh, or the things that we're seeing most frequently, are those items that are related to transparency. Uh, the GDPR, as you know, really requires that organizations that handle the personal data of EU data subjects, EU residents, <clears throat> excuse me, um, they have a, a responsibility to be transparent with what they're collecting, how they're storing it, how they're protecting it, and what they're doing with it. Whether they're sharing it, how they're processing it, whether they're selling it, it's really all about transparency and giving additional rights to EU data subjects, to EU residents regarding their data. And those those items that have been of greatest concern and the, the questions that we're receiving are how do I present to my customer base here in the U.S. and perhaps some overseas that I am in compliance with GDPR? And what we're starting with really are privacy policies in terms of use, those real forward-facing uh, elements of compliance with GDPR. Um, as you know, there is a requirement to have a lawful basis for collecting data in the first place, and there's several bases for the lawful collection of personal data. So really, at the intake point on your website, if you're an organization, you have a, a website and you ask folks to provide certain information to get more information about goods or services that you might provide, uh, that's the point where you need to be very transparent about how you're collecting the data and what you're gonna do with it. So a very visible and easy to understand privacy policy and website terms of use are very important. Uh, we're helping clients with that. We're also making sure that, uh, that the organization is making clear that consent is voluntary and knowing and um, very easy to understand so that uh, individuals that are thinking about sharing their personal data with a company uh, do so in a knowing way, that they actively click on a box to say, I understand that by providing this personal data, XYZ company is going to use it in, in a way consistent with its privacy policy in terms of use. So there's no misunderstanding about, about what's go going to be done. Um, those are the things that I think a lot of companies are doing a good job uh, a good job with in the first 30 days, in the first four weeks. Um, what it leaves to be uh, discussed and what we're going to talk about over the next several minutes are a number of the other items that really have not been addressed and are only slowly being addressed. And, and those, those relate to, uh, and I think, John, you mentioned it, how, how uh, uh, compliance obligations are being operationalized within an organization, how companies are preparing to respond to the, uh, the uh, authorities in the EU, the supervisory authorities that have been stood up in each of the member states. When those requests come, from organizations uh, or individuals about how data is being handled, is there a structure in place? Will you be able to find the data regarding EU data subjects when you're asked? And of course, and this is related directly to, to preparedness in the US, uh, is your organization prepared to respond to any of a host of data security incidents? Um, so, we take a breath for a moment, let you let you you think about that and where your organization might be in terms of preparedness for response. And while you're doing that, let me say that while the GDPR is a European regulation, um, I welcome the fact that it has brought to the fore a conversation about information handling and and information governance and uh, security related to information, because what it really is asking you to do are many things that you really should be doing already. And uh, in my intro, uh, uh, Todd, you mentioned that my background for 21 years, I, I worked at the FBI 
largely in New York with a couple of diversions to Washington. And when I started at the FBI in 1996, there was one computer for every four agents in, in a field office like the New York office, one of the largest offices in the FBI, which is staggering to think about how that landscape has changed. And I was also in New York in 2001, in September, uh, when the attacks on the World Trade Center and in Pennsylvania and the Pentagon occurred. And at that time, the FBI was largely conducting investigations uh, on an individual case-by-case basis. The agents and analysts were typing up reports. It was on computers, but um, typing up reports, printing out those documents, and they were being velo-bound or uh, uh, housed in paper files on shelves in the office. So I, I got to live through the experience, the transformational experience of having an organization that's not just a law enforcement organization, but a national security organization, have to transform the way it does business uh, in a way that was very uncomfortable, frankly, that agents and analysts and computer scientists were very successful working the way they had worked up until that time. And the point is, without being long-winded, is that this is a, a, a warning call to say that, yes, this is a European regulation, but to persist in doing business the way things have been done, and, and even in ways that have been successful for many years, is not a recipe for success in the information age here. We have to adapt, and we have to be better. And part of the requirements of GDPR are that you're going to focus on not only transparency, but what kind of data you have, how you're going to access it, what you're doing with it, what the security is around that data, and your ability to respond to data security incidents. Those things should already be in place within your organization here in the U.S. Um, so, and yeah, the Jay, GDPR is a reminder, a reminder of that. Yep. And Jay, great, great insight. And um, I know one of the, of the questions that, that uh, have been asked is how how should companies be concerned about uh, getting on the radar of the EU regulators uh, in terms of uh, precursor incidents? Uh, you know, obviously, mm -hmm. if you had some of the security incidents we've seen in the past uh, involving compromise that would very likely then result in a GDPR incident. And what other ways, too, in terms of maybe data subject requests or um, people that may be trolls of sort? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, excellent question. And a question that I hear frequently from clients, why should I care about this? My business is centered in Detroit or Dallas or Los Angeles. And, yes, I may have some customers. Uh, the Internet's a big place, and, and my site's accessible to folks overseas. Why should I care about this? Why would supervisory authorities, regulators in the EU, kick on my organization and shine a light on my information handling processes? And the, the short answer is, well, it, that it, this could create risk in a number of ways. Are supervisory authorities going to focus on you specifically, just you know, uh, throwing darts at a dartboard? No, no. What I think is most likely to, to be the risk to consider and to be prepared for are uh, uh, consumers who file a request in connection with a data breach and may not be within your organization. It may be within an organization that you partner with or that you're a vendor for uh, or that's a client. And when they report their incident to the supervisory authority, let's say in the UK or to Germany, the questions that are going to be asked are, who are your other processors? Who else touches the data within your organization? And they're going to dutifully have to report. It's ABC company, uh, DEF company, and XYZ company in the U.S., this company in Brazil, this company in Germany. And the inquiry is going to spiral out from there. So the supervisory authority is going to ask you, do you do business with, with ABC company? And if so, we need to see, we need to know more about your information handling practices. And that's when the inquiry is going to begin on your side. It could be through no fault of your own. could be through a partner. The, the, the other likely scenarios, uh, frankly, could be from a disgruntled employee that leaves on bad terms with the organization 
and decides to contact a supervisory authority to say, I know that, that my former company is not compliant and that I know they've signed agreements with vendors and with partners to say they're compliant and they aren't. Uh, and I, I hate to be uh, uh, a negative thinker in this space, but that's born out of inquiries that my firm and our practice group deals with in the U.S. And I think it's a good time to, to take a pause and, and draw a pra- parallel between the supervisory authorities in the, in the EU and in the, e- in the U.S. We, of course, in the U.S. don't have an overarching federal piece of legislation regarding data privacy and cybersecurity. What we have is a patchwork of 50 different data breach notification statutes and a few dozen information security standards on the state level. So it's a real mosaic of state law that governs this space. And what we're seeing is that the attorneys general that often oversee investigative units in a particular state are becoming very, very aggressive in conducting investigations into data security incidents. And that comes sometimes from an insider that, that calls. Sometimes it's from a citizen complainant who's concerned about an incident and doesn't know where to turn. So they call their supervisory authority or their attorney general to say, uh, you know, there's a lot of unusual credit activity going on. I think I'm the victim of fraud and that it, it could be coming from A, B, or C. And they have that obligation to investigate both the attorneys general in the U.S. and the supervisory authorities. So there is risk there. And given the, the amount of resources that have gone into this regulation, and given that this is uh, the result of really decades of thought in the EU, uh, the result of decades of thought, this regulation is not going anywhere and will very likely uh, be copied and mirrored by state authorities in the U.S. There's a bill pending in California. We know that the Colorado recently amended uh, state law regarding data privacy. So this landscape looking forward is, is going to continue to trend toward increased oversight in data governance and uh, information security uh, handling. Great. Uh- Thanks, Jay. Mm-hmm. So, Marty, uh, I know you have a lot of uh, uh, many clients that you are advising right now on GDPR. So, uh, looking forward to your perspective in terms of, again, what you're seeing in the past 30 days and, you know, what your insight is on, on GDPR readiness. No, oh, thanks, John, and thanks, Jay, and thanks, everybody uh, on the call today. And, I, you know, I think I would echo um, J- Jay's comments on what we're seeing out there, and, and particularly his comment that, you know, companies seem to come in sort of two buckets. They're late to the game. They haven't done anything or very little to prepare for GDPR, or they've done uh, a lot, but I think they've missed the mark. They've gone in too high. And so, you know, uh, when you think about GDPR, the essence is, is simply this. If you have personal data of an EA citizen, you have to uh, protect it and you have to use it appropriately, right? And the, and the expectation is that you, you can operationalize that. And what's good about GDPR is, I mean, we, it's, it, to me, it's a little akin to inside baseball. I, the, the, the DPAs have um, been very, you know, explicit on what the expectations are. Uh, John's got up, you know, what the... Um, uh, the Irish Data Protection Commissioner says, and they're, and they're saying it specifically, hey, you have to know, what are you holding? Why are you holding it? How do you obtain it? How do you secure it, right? The uh, United Kingdom Information Commissioner, again, very explicit here. You know, we don't care how you document your processing activities, but you have to be granular. You have to do it in a meaningful way, and, and we translate that to you have to operationalize that, right? So I, I think the challenge here is that we can all read that, but, but what does that really look like? And so I wanted to spend just a couple minutes on kind of drawing out some illustrations and thinking about, again, you know, I, I mean, what, what am I going to be required to do? Protect it, use it appropriately. Yeah. How am I going to deal with the data subject access requests? Let me just take a second and paint a couple of illustrations here, right? Everybody on today's uh, webinar has a human resource function. And I I uh, absolutely agree with Jay that, 
you know, I, I think you can anticipate fully that um, you're going to see disgruntled employees, contractors, what have you, being the root cause uh, of, of a lot of investigations or a lot of inquiries by uh, the data protection authorities, and, and for a couple of reasons in particular, right? One, constitutionally, the, the authorities are required to follow up and investigate these complaints. And two, there's the compensation provision. So you've got uh, sort of baked in GDPR, a financial motivation to, uh, to uh, you know, go after organizations. But you talk about HR, right? And, and you, you know, there's everybody on boards people. Everybody pays their people. You got benefits. You, you evaluate your people. You train them. And then ultimately you sever ties. Right. So a lot of personal data collected and managed through this process. When you really look at even one of these um, processes, recruiting and onboarding, right, there's a lot of data moving around, right, that you are now required to, you know, have an inventory of, to understand how you're controlling it, protecting it, how you're using it. And oh, by the way, you know, one of the provisions of, of GDPR is that you have to get rid of it once you've completed your bargain for why you collected it and all legal requirements have been fulfilled. So, you know, everybody on the call, think about the, the complexity here. You know, when you onboard somebody, they probably come in through maybe your website, maybe you still fill out a resume, you know, that gets emailed around, maybe you work with a third party that's uh, uh, an outsourced to HR uh, uh, firm or something, you've got resumes or CVs that are stored on hard drives. And, and so, you know, you think about it, this is one aspect of, uh, of the whole process of, of HR and where all this personal data is, right? And you're accountable for that. And, and, and that's when I say that what we've seen organizations, and unfortunately, in some instances, invest a lot, a lot of time and money, others not so much, but they've gone in at such a high level. And I think anybody on the day's call, you know, sort of as a, as a test that you can perform on yourself, you can look at the guidance that's been given by the authorities and look at where you're at and say, could I answer these questions? Do I have this degree of granularity? Uh, let, let me show you what, what this should look like. So everybody has a register. I think you're likely familiar with the concept of your data processing registry. It's, it's, it's referred to as the Article 30. So this is the, 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 the documentation that you're um, to have if an authority comes, right? And you, you look at the regulation itself. It's, it's very explicit on the different provisions, right? And, 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 and John and Jay both touched on this. You have to know what data elements are we actually processing. Do I have a first and last name? Do I have, you know, a national ID number or social security number here in the U.S.? What do I have and, and where is that at in my organization? It's an email. It's in my file shares. It's no tall order uh, or, or no small order that, 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 to have this information, but you have to. You have to be able to demonstrate that you have command of this. And, and, and ultimately, you need to anticipate these data subject access requests that you're going to have to contend with. There's also provisions about envisioned retention, right? Again, you have to get rid of this personal data once you fulfilled the bargain for why you collected it in the first place, and you've exhausted all legal requirements. Or have they been met? And this is a real challenge for people. I know John's going to talk in a minute about um, uh, how uh, you can approach, you can operationalize, you know, understanding this, uh, the handling data subject access requests. But, but I would offer this and to say, you know, perhaps the best um, position to be in when you get a, a data subject access request is if you don't have it at all and you're confident in that. The second uh, best position is to be able to uh, know where that information is to be able to um, to retrieve it. And, and John's going to talk touch on that in, in just a second. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I want to show one more provision too. And, and again, that is um, not all personal data is, is considered equal under GDPR, right? And so you have this concept of special category. This is uh, the super secret stuff. Um, and, and when you say what we, what, and we ask the question, what are we finding with, with organizations out there? Um, uh, in many instances, uh, a, a woefully uh, low recognition of where special category data is. Um, and I think this is going to be, unfortunately, incredibly problematic uh, for organizations. As, as, as Jay said, you know, GDPR is not really new. It's been in the works for over 30 years, and you have to understand the minds of the Europeans, and they take very seriously uh, certain types of personal data, hold it very sacred, and, and, and you have a lot of um, 
requirements around handling that. And, uh, yeah, and, and, and so, and, and, yeah. Yeah, in fact, Please. it's Jay. Let me jump in, jump in at this point just to, to draw a parallel that I think will be helpful. This is, is super helpful looking at, at the re- specific requirements of Article 30 and all the different uh, uh, requirements to track data that, that you are supposed to be in command of. What we're seeing in our practice on the incident response side is that when there's a data security incident, it can be a phishing email and, and an employee induced to give up a credential that gives a bad actor access into the environment. And then they start looking around for ways to uh, they conduct surveillance, some reconnaissance to see what kind of data might be valuable that they can take. This is happening every day, unfortunately. And when, when the organization learns of the data security incident, there's a big scramble to figure out what could the bad actor have had access to what kind of data do I have? Where is my sensitive data? Apart from GDPR's requirement for special categories of data and knowing where it is and tracking it, you, organizations need to know that because under emergency conditions, it's very difficult to piece together uh, uh, where your personally identifiable information is within your environment. And the HR example is a great one. Just how many different areas within your environment that data can live in and there are legal obligations in the u.s to report to consumers and regulators regarding unauthorized access to that data so i just make the point regarding return on investment that thinking in a forward way about gdpr learning to train your staff and your organization to know where the data is and that includes excellent point retention and destruction schedules because we, I, I deal with a number of clients who unfortunately have held on to data that was no longer helpful for any legitimate business purpose. It's just, we just keep storing it, just keep shoveling it into the storeroom, so to speak. And when those incidents occur, it has catastrophic consequences in terms of reputational harm, uh, uh, cost, the forensic cost and notification costs um, to, to remediating these kind of incidents. So. I just want to take a pause for a couple minutes to draw that parallel to the U.S. in that these information handling practices are going to reap great benefits in terms of improving your information security posture overall, but also helping you get past and the inevitable incident. You, know, you have human beings involved. There's always going to be something that occurs. And the more organized and knowing you are about what data you have, only keeping the data that you need, and being able to manage that data appropriately, you're gonna be that much better off to deal with an incident in the US when it comes and uh, get back to business, you know, minimize the effects of that. Sorry, jump in. No, and Jay, I, I'd ask you to make one more comment. You know, our experience, I've been doing this an awfully long time, uh, has been that when the unfortunate happens, and, uh, and, and it will to all companies at some point, you know, um, I think our clients have been um, have experienced that when the um, law enforcement shows up, the regulators follow suit. But their ability to demonstrate their command, their documentation, <clears throat> to, to illustrate what they have done, um, the steps they have taken, has gone a long way for them. Right? I mean, it's it, to some extent. And, and again, I'm, I'm, this is more of a question to you, but I think it can really set the tone for what is going to transpire going forward. I mean, um, would you comment on that from maybe mm-hmm. from your experience? Yeah. You, you've got a unique perspective as an attorney uh, representing clients, but also in law enforcement. Right. It, it sure does. Um, a, a great point that when uh, now let me wear my current hat as as a lawyer representing clients who dealt with. And to be clear, these don't have to be dramatic breaches uh, and systems intrusions. It, they can be as simple as an employee uh, on travel that loses a laptop that's unencrypted, that has all kinds of spreadsheets and tables and client data for thousands of customers um, that requires notification. That's the more ordinary, but those things happen all the time. When those regulators respond uh, and, and start asking questions about information handling, the ability to respond to those interrogatories or those written lists of questions 
quickly and with exhibits and policies and exemplars of, of how data is handled and numbers to back that up, it's very impressive to the regulators to show, hey, we're taking, we take this seriously in our organization. We're squared away. Yes, these things happen. It's unfortunate that it happened, but we know exactly what happened, and this is what we're going to do to minimize the likelihood that it's going to happen again. You can never say that it's never going to happen again because, you know, you, we always find new ways to, to mess things up. But um, to, to address the, the problem or the protocol that, that, that was a little deficient that led to the incident or contributed, that's the best answer that you can give to say, are, we're in a good place to begin with, and despite doing our level best to protect this data and handle it appropriately, we fell a little short here, but this is what we're going to do. The focus of the response can be, yes, this happened, we're in good shape otherwise, and this is what we're going to do to make doubly sure it doesn't happen again. That's the best way to avoid a protracted investigation and fines. These are self-funded uh, uh, units within the regulators, largely, and their ability to, to assess fines means more computers, more staff, uh, more funding for projects, and that's just sadly the way it is. So, yeah, I mean, a great point. That um, being able to respond quickly instead of scrambling to say, what are we going to tell them? I'm not sure. We don't know what's going on. We don't have a good sense for where this data is, where it came from, is 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 more the the rule rather than the exception, uh, unfortunately. Well, I, I think those are my um, co comments predominantly. I'm anxious to uh, for John for you to, to to hear your thoughts on this. So I'll turn it over to you. Great, thanks, Marty, uh, and that was a great insight from you and Jay. And so tying into what. Marty discussed on the information aspects. We can see that GDPR is, you know, a regulatory requirement that at the end of the day is about information. So it's an information governance challenge. Um, you know, I recently uh, attended a, a Microsoft Sun that they had for um, uh, their, their, key, their partners and on GDPR, and they had an excellent keynote speaker, uh, Enza Ayanapalo from. Forrester Research, she was a GDPR expert, and in her presentation, she just had a single slide, and the only thing it said was that, data, quote, data discovery and classification are the foundation of GDPR compliance, uh, end quote. Uh, and then Enza, you know, went on to, I think, correctly observe that in order to comply with GDPR, you have to actually know where your data is. Uh, policies are important first step, but if you don't have the ability to find data uh, from an operational standpoint, you know, both proactively as part of your data mapping assessment and data auditing, and then also reactively to comply with specific requests and action items under GDPR, you know, then really your compliance program is ultimately hollow. So, and then you have the commonly cited statistic that 80% of data in the enterprise is, un is unstructured and distributed across it. So organizations tend to have a decent handle on structured data, but you know, really so much data which is subject to GDPR is found on local laptops, desktops, and in file servers and SharePoint, and that's all spread across the enterprise. And you know, that's an, a very critical information governance challenge because traditional means to search and manage that data in an operational manner have, have really failed. So to address this, um, we have a technology process that ties into the, 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 the policies and procedures that, that Jay and, and, and Marty have outlined, and that's excellent data audit and compliance. Uh, this is built upon the proven uh, X1 platform with the X1 search index, which is uh, highly popular and in, in use for, for over a decade. And this is key because this enables us to search across thousands of, of PCs, including laptops, desktops, uh, and file servers, and return results in minutes instead of weeks or days, which is what other processes require. And in order to find your data and know where it is, it applies GPR, you have to really you know, be able to search 
you know, your whole enterprise. So where, where is this data that's non-compliant? Uh, again, both from practically and reactively uh, standpoint. So in addition to comprehensive search, we can then report in a detailed fashion and then take action on it by migrating it or, or even delete in place, including within email containers, which is a very unique and important capability. So this is very powerful uh, capability that we will demo for you in just one minute. So uh, how does this all map specifically to GPR in terms of the actual language? Uh, so there is the ability, again, to do these assessments, know where your data is, to search across all your unstructured data for, for PII related to data the subjects. There's also many other benefits uh, toward your normal privacy and information governance programs. Um, you can then obviously detect, report, and then delete in place or even migrate that data. So in addition to searching, you can also take action upon that data all within the same, the same program. Uh, from a reactive standpoint, you can it's important to be able to, to react to the data subject access request, the right to be forgotten, uh, the right to, or to simply to report on data that you have maintained, uh, or uh, to transfer port, port data, or simply minimize that data. Uh, all of those require a very operational ability to, re to respond. And then finally, accountability. We have the ability to report. This is a, an e-discovery platform as well, so there's an entire uh, a degree of defensibility that is built in um, that enables us to to uh, have confidence in, in in the system and create a, 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 a defensible report. Okay, so quickly um, about X1, uh, uh, we're next generation uh, e-discovery enterprise search. We're built upon the powerful X1 search platform. Hundreds of thousands of users use X1 search for their personal productivity and we also have many enterprise customers. Uh, Marty, do you want to briefly um, uh, talk about your practice at Jordan Lawrence? Uh, you know, I, I, thank you, John, but I want for the sake of time, I mean, I would just say that um, we've been around a lot of years. We're an ACC Alliance partner, and if you need uh, the, the fundamentals of, of understanding your data and being able to manage those inventories or getting rid of it, your third parties, um, we can do a, a, a great job there for you. But I'm going I'm to turn it back to you, John. Great. All right. At this point, um, I'd like to introduce Joe Seguino. And Joe uh, is going to give a very brief uh, five-minute product, uh, uh, really going through an exercise. And the scenario here is that a company has received a uh, data subject access request from an individual named Hans Anderson. And um, Joe will take us through both showing us the proactive use cases as well as responding to that data subject access request. Great, thanks, John. Um, what you should be seeing is my uh, desktop. I'm gonna be showing you from two points of view, one being the um, compliance uh, administrator uh, and the other one actually being the end user, okay? So from that administrator standpoint, you can see everything's broken down by my project. Um, obviously security plays a role here, so you'll only be able to see what you're allowed to see. So you may have many projects behind the scenes, but only uh, you only have access to certain ones. As I drill into the actual project, I will see my jobs that are running. You can see that one that John referenced, that Hans Anderson uh, did uh, ask us for a data subject uh, access request. He provided it to us. Uh, certain pieces of information potentially is obviously name, email address, maybe social security number, address, and so on. So we can take that information, apply that to the request, and send it out to um, all of our users and or uh, network servers or network shares. Um, as I drill into this particular request, I can manage it and keep an eye on it and make sure my users are actually taking care of this request. And you can see here, based on some of this information, I can see some folks have finished it. Some folks are offline. Um, you can see a, a couple of folks are still online and they have not touched it. I can always drill into this information to get more details. I can find out um, what they did, when they did it, how many items they, they, they may have deleted or moved or kept. So uh, all of that information is maintained inside of the database so we can keep track of all that. You'll notice here that Stephen Harris is one of my users that is still running. He's online. I'm gonna switch to Stephen's desktop so you can see what Stephen receives in this GDPR request. 
Um, up top here, you'll notice I'm on two different desktops. As I click on Stephen's desktop, you notice here if I go to my start, I now became Stephen Harris. Uh, a notification came up to Stephen and says, hey, we need you to take a look at this GDPR request. Um, here's some of the information. Obviously, all this is configurable. We're going to start this right now. Our product then converts into kind of a lockdown mode and presents Stephen with instructions on what to do. Here's all the information that's pertaining to this one particular GDPR request. You can see Hans, street address, and so on. On the left-hand side, and obviously more instructions can be applied here. This is completely, again, configurable by you. On the left-hand side, we break down into two areas, uh, searches, if you will, that will present to Stephen what he has to do. So as he clicks on his to-do button, you can see Stephen has four documents um, with some type of, uh, you know, relevant information on that based on that search. So you can see here, Hans Anderson's name is highlighted, maybe Social Security and so on. Um, Stephen at this point has two options. He can either delete or keep this information. This may prove to be obviously tied to Hans, so we're going to want to go ahead and delete it. And then we move on to our next document. And at this point, Stephen would go through each and every document that he has and, and provide this information. If you were to choose to keep it, we can also apply subcategories. Why do you want to keep this? Maybe this is not relevant. Maybe this is not Hans Anderson who requested it. Maybe this is a Hans Anderson, a friend of Stevens, or even a coworker, right? So it's not part of this request, or it's a personal item, or any other type of information. Again, all this information is then logged inside of our database and kept, so you can always run reports against it at a later point in time. If we needed to show this information was actually taken care of a year from now, we can quickly run a report and show exactly what Stephen did on the date, the number of items that he had, and what he deleted, and so on, right? Um, so I'll go ahead and click on select. We'll, we'll apply these tags, and we'll actually just click on our complete and move through. Um, you'll also notice here he has more, uh, excuse me, that it went from the to-do to, uh, to the completed area, right? So it moves the information along so Stephen can visually see what he has to do and what he doesn't have to do, right? Um, we'll go ahead and click on complete, even though we're not complete, just so you get the process here. And as I click on the yes, it'll then take this information, package it all up, take the action that's necessary, and move it forward to our database. Okay? If I look back to my administrator and what that administrator would be seeing, um, at this point, he can or she can monitor this, this page and, and make sure that Stephen is processing this information. If not, we can, uh, you know, send them emails or send them reminders, whatever type of information we need to, to let them know they need to take care of this information. Okay. Um, again, that was from more of that reactive point of view. Um, if I wanted to do more of a proactive search or a, a request, um, I can go right to my, I'm going to jump, jump to a different screen. I can go right to our proactive analytics area, right? This allows me to enter in different types of searches or keywords allows me to go after specific targets. So here you can see I have five targets right now. If I wanted to add more targets, it's just a matter of clicking on the search and then going after different desktops. So you can see I have maybe five or six more desktops. I can add all of these and then go back to where I was and then apply that particular search. Now I'm looking after these nine desktops proactively, right? I want to see what our risk here is. Um, how many times does Hans Anderson appear on any email or file that's out in our, in our organization? Um, this is also where John mentioned we can go after pattern recognition. So if I'm looking for an ID, maybe a passport number, a driver's license, an uh, international driver's license, passport, and so on, I can also be searching for that types of information. All right, so proactively, I can go after this information and find out what's in our system, what our risk is, how much information is out there, and so on. And you can see dynamically it's going after these desktops and bringing me back all that information. In this example, I'm looking at it based on the actual desktop. I can also drill down and just look at it based on the actual keyword itself or term. Right? These are very simple searches on my left, but I could be looking for every email that went to a certain domain with these five terms and maybe within this date range. Right, so I can actually hone in my search to my specific requirement as necessary. Okay, so again, more of that proactive looking to see what my risk assessment is out there. Okay, John, I'm going to turn it back to you at this point. Thank you, Joe. Well, that's, uh, that's impressive. Uh, it's Jay. I want to ask Joe a quick question about 
the, the product and, and what it would take. Is it is it uh, on-site hardware and software? Can this be configured remotely? I'm trying to anticipate questions that, that folks in that have tuned in may have. Excellent question. Yeah, absolutely. The it is on premise. It's uh, we're a software provider, so we're providing that software, and it can also be run in the cloud on that you know that particular hardware that you need. So, um, but it is contained within you know the, the cloud and or your environment. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, great. Thank you, Joe. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, we're going to now open it up to question and answers. Uh, and again, a reminder, the slides from today's presentation can be downloaded right from the GoToWebinar console at any time. And recording of today's webinar, along with slides and other resources, will be emailed to everyone within one week. So um, go ahead, and if you have any questions, you can type them into the chat window um, or the question window in your, uh, your GoToMeeting console, and we'll, uh, we'll queue those up and, and address them. So. So we have one question uh, so far. It says, it is right for, for Jay. Have we seen any existing enforcement claims uh, thus far uh, since GDPR went into effect? That, that's a good question. Um, I don't, well, you may have seen the lawsuit from Max Schrems, uh, who's a, uh, a data activist, I guess he would, he would call himself. Um, against Google and Facebook uh, and WhatsApp. Um, so that it, it's, a, it's hard to know right now what the data protection authorities, the supervisory authorities are focused on. We will see that, um, we will see that soon. I, I, I think there's gonna be more publicity about some kind of what's called the marquee actions that are brought uh, to make a statement against multinational corporations for not complying with GDPR, as well as those maybe exclusively within the EU. But it's a little early there. Um, I will tell you, though, that what is in in the news, um, we, we see a lot of concern over information handling and uh, 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 particularly with foreign foreign nations and uh, Google's responsibility for not doing a better job monitoring uh, data and and uh, activities conducted on consent and even even something like the Wells Fargo incident that I think started back in 2016 or 2017 with fraudulent accounts being opened by by uh, banking representatives, and, and there was hundreds of them, and, and there were really several hundred people fired as a result. How would that have played out today if GDPR were in effect for a global bank that that has that that is taking personal data that was collected on consent for a certain purpose and used to create fraudulent accounts? Um, let me use this as a reminder regarding the structure of the GDPR and the, the tiers of violations that could come down and find, as you know, there are two tiers to supervisory authorities' ability to uh, levy fines and um, investigate violations. And the higher tier, the ones that are considered more serious, are the ones that uh, affect the basic uh, rights of data subjects, including the failure to comply with conditions of consent. And I think many of these cases that we're seeing, including the Schrems lawsuit in, uh, against uh, Facebook and Google, are really going to be focused on that higher tier. So uh, it's a little early to tell, but it's something that we're all keeping keeping an eye on. Yeah. It's a really good point. And um, you know, one thing from maybe this question for both Jay and and Marty is that a lot of focus. You have pre-GDPR on fines. You heard so many vendors uh, using the scare tactics, fines, fines, fines. But uh, we've already seen some some class action suits, and uh, there is a pretty you know robust right of private action under GDPR that maybe companies weren't quite uh, uh, prepared for. And so maybe talk about uh, the ability for individuals to bring their own claims under GDPR yeah. and. and what do you think that means? Yeah, th that's significant. Under Article 82, in 
separate and apart from uh, supervisory authorities right to investigate incidents and, and issue fines and for violations is an individual's right to seek compensation from either a data controller or a data processor for damages suffered. And significantly, as it's written, the regulation does not distinguish between material, or let me put it this way, that if a person suffers even a non-material uh, harm or suffers non-material damage, most of the U.S. regulations focus on materiality and whether it's something significant that comes out of an action that's taken by an individual against another. Here, and, and I think it's very purposeful, very intentional, that the regulation is designed to have teeth. And what they're putting folks on notice about is that whether or not it's material, if there's any damage that results from an infringement into the regulation, uh, and a failure to comply with the provisions of the regulation, an individual has the right to receive compensation and can sue for uh, uh, for damages in connection with with mishandling of information. So the parallel to the U.S. is, as you said, uh, there are, are kind of like um, uh, patent trolls are, are looking to file lawsuits against uh, intellectual property holders uh, to just for nuisance value so that these, these suits will be settled and you can make a living doing that, just going from one to another. Um, here, I, I'm afraid to predict, but I, I think that it may happen in, in a similar vein that lawyers are going to be aggressively seeking that perfect lead plaintiff to Sue an organization that does some business or has uh, marketed uh, markets its its products and services to the EU to sue them for failure to comply with the provisions of the GDPR, and those may be well-founded suits or may not may maybe won't be well-founded, but it's going to be enough of a headache where a firm, an organization that's served with a complaint in a matter like that, is not going to want to have to deal with. Uh, the regulatory inquiry and to have a public airing as one of the first organizations that is being sued in connection with GDPR, they're going to be strong motivations to settle those matters. Um, again, whether or not they have merit, whether or not they're based on a material harm, I think it's it's what we should anticipate happening in, in the coming months. We'll, we'll all be watching that very closely. And, and John, I, I would add on to, to Jay's comments, very good comments. Um, you know, I think companies tend to look past uh, or, or get distracted, they, particularly like in, in manufacturing, as an example. And they say, you know, we don't we don't really have consumer data. Everybody's got employees and GDPR does not distinguish between consumer or employees. And uh, everybody's got disgruntled employees, you know, unfortunately. And and I think you see parallels again in this back to Colorado's new law. Right. The pending law in, in California. And if there was even no prospects of fines, if that were the case, still you're looking at enormous uh, consumption of resources just to have to deal with the, and respond to the regulators, to engage counsel, to uh, settle. So there is ample justification. Every organization should be thinking about this and talking about um, GDPR as well as the U.S. Um, privacy and security laws with their executive leadership. So I want to read, I, we, we didn't talk about this in preparing for this call, but I want to read five quick principles to you and, and then ask, uh, or, or as, as a parting thought on, on, on my end, regarding the GDPR. The five principles are, the purpose of data collection should be relevant to its use. In other words, you collect data that you need for a certain purpose. It's relevant to how you're going to use it. Number two, data should be protected against loss and unauthorized access. Three, individuals should have the right to know what data is collected about him or her. Four, individuals should have the right to access any data related to him or her, right to access. And finally, an individual should be able to challenge the retention of data or amend or erase data about him or her. Where do you think those principles came from? I'll give you the answer. It's a pop quiz. They came from the Office of Economic Cooperation and Development Guidelines 
1980 in Europe, 1980, was the Reagan administration. I think the Iran Contra, uh, I mean, not Contra, the, uh, the hostage situation was still ongoing. That's how, how long these, these principles have been under consideration about collecting data that you need, knowing where it is, protecting it, giving individuals the right to know what data is held about him or her, the right to access it and challenge it and erase it. These are things that, what, how many years ago is that? That's almost 40 years ago, right? So this, what I, I would end on uh, in terms of, of thinking about data and thinking about your preparedness to access and manage data in an appropriate way is that as technology helps us move forward and be more effective and efficient with providing quality goods and services to organizations, knowing where that data is and being able to access it quickly when needed for its response, for business purposes, in response to a, an inquiry from a European data subject, any of those reasons, the time to start budgeting and thinking about this, this can't happen overnight. It has to be part of a long and strategic uh, uh, process to say we have to, to get better in this space. Great. Thanks, Jay. Uh, that ties in a bit to one last question we had that's more technical on the collection capabilities of X1. And um, this platform we showed you really was the data audit component of it. And we have, uh, it's also dual use for e-discovery and data collection, which I think also ties into GDPR, as Jay has mentioned, a lot of these claims that come in, uh, right of access, have an aspect of being a subpoena. So responding to that in a defensible way, collecting data, acting on it, really there's a, there's a nice convergence with the e-discovery uh, and GDPR compliance. And in fact, our next webinar will be July 18th with Relativity. Speaking of e-discovery, we will highlight the integration with our X1 distributed discovery platform with the Relativity review platform. So looking forward to that on July 18th. I want to again thank our co-presenters, Jay Kramer and Marty Provin, and also want to thank all of the attendees, and we'll see you soon.